Welcome back to the Korean podcast and the literature series of our podcast, which we run every summer. And this is going to be the final episode for this summer. And of course, it would not be complete, not just this summer, but the entire series without today's guest. This is the author of Writers of the Winter Republic, Literature and Resistance in Park Chung Hee's Korea, and editor of Cultures of Yushin in South Korea in the 1970s. This is Associate Professor of Modern Korean Literature at the University of Michigan, Youngju Ryu. Youngju, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jess. Thank you for inviting me to be on and thank you for the generous introduction. Oh, no, it really is my pleasure. And it was my pleasure throughout the week reading through um, two chapters of yours. So we're going to talk about two small aspects of your work, but they are really fascinating. And of course, people will see how they build into the broader scope of your work as well. So um, we're going to split the podcast in half. First half, we'll speak about torture. And the second half, we'll talk about um, poetry. So it's going to be a nice break there. And of course, this is going to be really interesting. So the first part, about torture. Before we get into the literature side of this, I might get you just just to start with um, a brief uh, description of the strained history that modern Korea has when it looks back to its post-authoritarian um, era and the ideas of accountability and some of the challenges that South Korea has um, really dealing with its history of torture. Yeah, I think, of course, torture is not unique to Korea. Uh, it's not unique to Japan. But what I think has been particularly agonizing um, for South Koreans has been sort of the continuity that the torture, that the practice of torture, institutionalized torture by the state, um, the continuity that it represents um, between uh, pre-colonial, I mean, colonial and post-colonial uh, states. So um, torture as a practice, I mean, it's inhuman on, on multiple levels, um, but it's especially galling um, from the perspective of the South Korean left, because it's yet another instance of the legacy, the colonial legacy that um, South Korean state failed to, um, to purge when it became so-called the post-colonial state. So I think that's how I um, began my chapter um, that you uh, read uh, for this podcast. I began with a short, a very brief overview of that continuity. There was a really interesting part that you did mention in that chapter at the very start. So you mentioned literature, which we're gonna get to, but also film. And you said that, interestingly, when you look at these films in particular, um, it's kind of a shared criminality of, of kind, um, that every time yeah, there's, there's a desire and a satisfaction at the end of these films when the people being tortured can turn the torture, the, the, the torture and behaviour back on the torture. And this seems to be a constant theme, at least in the films. Yes, that, that is so. And I think, again, it's related to this overwhelming sense that um, uh, procedurally uh, Korea is supposed to have achieved democratization, and yet the people who should have been punished when that transition is made were not. Uh, and that's a similar, it's a repetition, uh, variation on a theme that again goes back to the colonial era and what happened in the immediate post-liberation period in South Korea regarding sort of pro-Japanese collaborators. So the desire to take into um, people's own hands the workings of justice and uh, justice that's violently meted out uh, has to do almost entirely with despair over the formal um, institutions of um, justice uh, that is supposed to be blind on the part of the, the state. Let's talk about, um, as a first way to jump into this, because I personally found it most interesting, I'm not sure about yourself, but um, let's talk about the, the novel Ginger. And yeah. um, um, we have to mention that this, I believe that this is based on a, a real life torture specialist, Yi, uh, Yi Kunan, 
And this becomes yeah. really important. So let's start with that particular novel, because this is a fascinating look into um, not just um, the interesting topic, but um, it, it, it does say something quite important that someone can base a novel in modern day Korea on a torture specialist and everyone know already know instinctively who that specialist was. Yes, um, and if um, if you let me, let me just say that when I was working on this article, when I began working on the article, the English translation of the novel um, by um, Bruce and Ju Chan Fulton had not yet been published. Um, so you know, I just went with my own translation, which is a literal translation of the Korean title. Okay, so Igunan is um, uh, the existing historical uh, person on which um, the major character of this novel is based. And he uh, was a highly decorated policeman um, who belonged to the anti-communist operations unit. And uh, he was decorated multiple times uh, for his ability, for his contribution to um, uh, anti-communism in South Korea, uh, specifically by arresting and getting confessions out of people who were suspected of being communist. Um, anyone with even a modicum of knowledge about uh, South Korean history uh, during the authoritarian era knows that anti-communism was a very sort of broad umbrella, a net um, that the authoritarian regimes of Chen Duhan and Park jung hee certainly used um, not only to catch uh, communists, but um, to um, you know, launch attacks against their political opponents and um, to launch political operations. So, um, yeah, Igunan, um, after a very prominent career in, in the police force, um, his sort of history uh, as a torture artist uh, came to light when um, the torture operations in this building in a, an area of Seoul called Namyeongdong came to light when a democratic democratization activist who subsequently went on to enjoy a, a very illustrious political career in post-democratization Korea, um, an activist named Kim Gun Tae um, uh, managed to disclose uh, what had gone on and what had happened to him during his days of uh, uh, confinement in Namyeongdong. And Kim Igunan was sort of uh, singled out as one of the torture spellers, especially. Yeah, so Igunan, uh, uh, his story is pretty amazing and stranger life uh, is stranger than fiction sometimes because. Uh, Igunan was on the run and in hiding. Uh, after his case, he became sort of the face of the torture operations that the South Korean and authoritarian government had going for many years. And um, he gave himself up only after the statute of limitations had expired on his involvement with Kim Gun Tae's torture. Um, nevertheless, you are still arrested because there was some other case uh, that uh, a, a lesser known case um, that he had been involved in that hadn't expired. And so he got booked on that uh, case and he did serve a jail term. And he, so he was one of the few uh, people actually who worked for the South Korean police, um, especially in this anti-communist communism unit. Um, as torture specialists who actually ended up, you know, having to pay in, in, in legal terms uh, with incarceration for what he did. Um, but the fact that he was uh, hide, in hiding for so many years 
And when he was finally caught, it, um, it came to light that he was hiding uh, in the attic of his house the whole time. Um, so that became also kind of sensational. Um, and I think the author, Tan Young, uh, took that story of Iganan and was so affected by it um, that she wanted to write a novel about it. And of course, she introduced some major differences um, from the actual event and the actual story of Iganan's hiding that allowed the tale to be told in a very different way. And in my chapter, I focus on how the tale uh, of Iganan's uh, hiding goes from, um, I mean, becomes, is transformed into a daughter's tale. Let's, um, let's jump into that for a bit, because um, really interesting point here. You write um, that the language in, in this tale is really quite interesting, especially when you contrast it with other um, novels that, that, that depict torture at the time. So you write that it's quite lyrical. And when, they, when she writes about the body and the pain, she does so with an almost erotic tone to it. And this, you write, is quite different to other novels, such as The Red Room or The Road to uh, Choma Tome, where this is quite different, um, a really change, and in, not just in tone, but a change in the literary landscape in some way, and just um, how this works. So take us there. Why is this so interesting? Why is, why is this so significant? What is she trying to do here? Yeah, so, you know, it's my, of course, interpretation, <laughs> and um, I haven't checked it with Chan Young. But I feel like what's, what, what ends up happening uh, with this new mode of language that she introduces in, in the way she engages with torture, um, in the chapter that I, uh, in, in, the, in this chapter, I talk about three distinct modes, uh, testimonial, I call them testimonial, uh, allegorical and parodic. And for the most part in literature, torture has been a theme and a subject in the testimonial mode. And um, what happens in the testimonial mode often is the violence of torture and the absurdity in humanity and brutality of torture is really highlighted uh, in terms of the way just everyday people, like regular folks, could engage in torture with, without skipping a beat, without having it weigh on their conscience. And, you know, they're just regular fathers, they're good men, you know, they're responsible citizens, and they go to work, and then they beat the sh shit out of somebody or bring somebody close to uh, his desk, right? Um, so that's the testimony. That's the major sort of uh, mode of representation in the testimonial literature about torture. I think this novel Ginger does something very different by eroticizing uh, and lyric and 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 aestheticizing um, the practice. Uh, what it does is it kind of maximizes the. Um, you know, what I call the standard of energy surrounding the, uh, the torturer, the, the father figure, uh, so that he emerges not as, you know, your, your Joe Schmo, your everyday um, John Doe, you know, just working um, with the banal banality of evil, um, but as someone, you know, who really is filled with sort of charisma, um, with and it's given this extraordinary investment, um, and then the work, the novel, the work of the novel will then have to be. You know, initially he said off and presented to us in that way, and the work of the novel throughout the few hundred pages um, will be to strip this charismatic figure, this you know uber father, and, uh, of his power and of his charisma, of his energy and reduce him within the domain of, within the domain where um, the standard of energy is still operating, not standard of morality, um, to reduce him within that domain to some, a figure that is very infantile. And yes. I, mm, you know, sorry. for me that, I'm sorry, and for me that operation has an ethical and political consequence uh, within the South Korean contemporary scene. 
that there is um one um element there that that, that you you touched on briefly in passing and this is really important here um and this is the role of the daughter in this story so the father is hiding in the attic and the daughter is um of course um, sheltering him in the attic and there's a, a real interesting interplay between the guilt in both parties, the guilt of the father, of course, but also the associated guilt of the daughter um, and the stain here. And it's uh, a kind of guilt that someone has when they've done nothing wrong, but it still is obviously there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that is the insight uh, of this novel and one of the reasons why it, I found it uh, so compelling. Uh, on the one hand, I mean, you have the juxtaposition of the father and daughter, and the juxtaposition is physical because literally, um, in a but in in real life, Iganan was supported by his wife. Uh, in the novel, the wife figure is sort of taken out of the picture relatively early, and the daughter becomes the guardian of a father in the father's hiding, and they're physically together with just that, um, you know. Uh, the father's floor being the daughter's ceiling uh, because he's up in the attic. Um, and they couldn't be more, dis, uh, more unlike each other, dissimilar in the way they confront this question of guilt. So for the daughter, um, you know, she's not obviously, I mean, we, we can't hold someone guilty for something that she, did, she wasn't party to, that she didn't even know what's going on. And the entire novel is her, her, um, the process of her coming to terms with the fact, well, yes, I'm guilty, even if I didn't know. I'm sorry that I didn't know. I'm sorry that, one, that I didn't know that one could be guilty without knowing. So that's the position that she ends up at. Um, whereas a father, uh, he remains to the end. Um, someone who seeks to have an alibi. And I, in the chapter, I talk about alibi in its original Latin meaning of elsewhere, being elsewhere, but also kind of abrogating the authority elsewhere. So then, um, you know, I was doing my job. I was, uh, you know, um, being, I was being a patriotic citizen in this um, divided country, South Korea with the northern half threatening our security. I mean, that's that's the alibi that's um, basically been in operation for the anti-communist uh, unit and for the torture, uh, the secret police torture um, cells. And so he he kind of holds on to that and clings to that even more tightly. Um, so to the very end, he he is unable and refuses to emerge as a subject, a subject who can be guilty uh, because, you know, the decisions um, that shape his life originate from outside of him, from elsewhere, and that's his alibi. He does emerge change, though, doesn't he? And you touched on this again just a little bit before, but this is really important. So he writes, um, describing himself here, so this is the, the, the character in the book, a child hiding alone in a dark and clammy cave. So he doesn't, as you said, he doesn't um, embrace um, any sort of atonement or responsibility for his actions. But <clears throat> importantly, the author does write him dramatically changed, emerging uh, a shriveled version of himself, his manhood gone. Everything is just uh, um, uh, so there is a, a kind of moral reckoning of a kind, despite the fact that he's never um atone for his actions or claim responsibility. Yeah. And so I, I, I would agree with you there, Jet. I mean, what happens because he's initially set off uh, in the language, I mean, what I call this language of plenitude um, about his power um, locates him within a domain, within a realm where the standard is of energy and not of morality. And at the end, he's completely without power. I mean, his, his muscles have atrophied, you know, uh, his, uh, his daughter buys him shoes that are too big uh, so that he, even there, even his feet are no longer, are much smaller than they used to be, or at least that's the experience he has. And he's kind of really regressed uh, 
over the over the course of the novel to the point where he does. I mean, he is shriveled up as an old, older man, but he's also infantilized. And then he talks about the mother's womb, the attic being the mother's womb, etc. Uh, and so, according to that standard of energy, uh, you know, he has just he has lost. He has lost the. Um, is completely disempowered. And because he, he will not emerge as a subject and occupy a, a different plane where you would have a different uh, form of reckoning, um, the standard of morality, you know, that's all he, he is. He's just a pitiful shell at the end without... Um, uh, well, there's no redemption for him. Mm. Let me put it that way. It, it, it does, because he never does um, claim any redemption or any responsibility. Um, it, it seems to be a very interesting statement on, on Courier's past in some way. So you had a quote there and he said, torture is patriotism. And of course, he emerges um, uh, fairly unrepentant, um, nonplussed about what he's done. And this seems to be a very strong statement about um, unthinking loyalty. And that was one of the, the one of those, um, this authoritarian era that we're looking back to. So many people, so many mistakes were made in this idea of you're doing it for your nation. Yeah, but I think, you know, the reason why also that I'm interested in this question and the reason why I think Chang Young's novel is so um, insightful in some ways is the interplay between sort of the standard of energy and standard of morality in the way they um, interweave and structure the contemporary Korean political terrain. So, you know, you have a lot of people um, when I mean, you have supporters uh, of the Park Jung hee regime, let's say, when pressed on this question of, but, you know, Park jong killed these people. I mean, think about, uh, you know, the People's Revolutionary Party. Think about his political opponents whom, whom he uh, executed. Think about um, all of the, you know, laborers um, who, um, uh, who, were, who were persecuted um, under his dry economic drive. Um, and how immoral is that? When pressed with that question, you have a lot of Koreans who would say, well, Korean situation after the war and after, you know, um, um, the uh, unsuccessful sort of reconstruction in the 1950s uh, was so, uh, so exceptional, exceptionally poor and exceptionally destitute that you couldn't apply that kind of, you couldn't do things regularly, you couldn't do things humanely, you couldn't apply the morality uh, standard to the Korean case. And so then they, uh, you have people who would say, well, dictatorship was necessary uh, in order for us to get to where we are. Um, and there they really apply the standard of energy. And Park Jung-hee is someone who got things done. He was a father figure. He was a patriarch for the nation. And you know he was the one who freed Koreans from what you know, thousands of years of hunger. Um, and so what this book does is it tackles the father figure on that plane of the standard of energy and finds him and, and completely demyth demythologizes him on, on that plane rather than kind of um, talk about how sort of inhumane he was. And so, it, in you know, in a very interesting way, I find this um, this text a really a powerful reflection on on the park on the Park Jung Hee era. Even though obviously we're talking about the torture specialists, we're talking about even on. But when I was writing this chapter, I really had in mind this question: What if Park Geun Hye, the daughter of Park Jung Hee, dealt with her father's legacy, the mad father in the attic? As mm. Sun in the in this novel did, um, rather you know, and how how differently things could have turned out, right? Um, but of course, we know that Park didn't do that. Park was very uh, committed to resurrecting and rehabilitating her father's reputation. 
So, you know, I think it's a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I don't know if Chun, Chun Un Young was thinking about that when she was writing this novel. I kind of suspect that she was. Um, but, you know, it's a very interesting novel to read when you bring in that additional layer. That is a, a fascinating thought, actually. You have me staring out the window as you're speaking, thinking just about that, about what that campaign would have looked like. It is interesting. And we're going to get to Park Rene as well a little bit more in a moment when we talk about poetry. But you mentioned a little earlier, and uh, um, this this is uh, from, you know, literature to real life. This, this is hard to know just how... Um, um, these two are disconnected because this sounds like literature for anyone unfamiliar with it. This is an extraordinary moment um, in, Yi Kun, in Yi Kunan's life. So he is, of course, as you say, he comes out of, of the attic, not in the novel, but in real life. And he has this extraordinary meeting with Kim, tu, uh, Kim Tun Hei, um, uh, the, who is now Minister of Health and Welfare in yeah. the in in the government and the yeah. story goes that he falls onto his knees and he begs for kunte's uh forgiveness who he had tortured himself and then the two men embrace or did they and that's the interesting story so take us there this really fascinating larger than life um postscript yeah so you know that's one of those things that you you want that ending uh and then it turns out that the ending um, was too good to be true. Um, so, you know, I mean, Kim Gun Kim Gun Tae, uh, after, um, well, for Kim Gun Tae, his sort of past as a democratic democratization activist becomes a real capital, political capital. Uh, in post-democratization South Korea, and he becomes one of the you know, leading politicians on the left on, among the progressives. And you know, when um, there's a change of power to progressive presidential administrations, then he is appointed to a uh, minister position. And in this instance, it's minister of like welfare, health and welfare or something like that, I think. And he visits Iganan in the prison and you know the press follow him and basically the scenario that they want to pursue is even on uh you know asks for kim gunte's forgiveness and kim gunte gives it and they embrace and basically we're korea is now ready to move forward from its sort of authoritarian past right we can put that behind us with this forgiveness with this with this apology and forgiveness the problem is um Basically, uh, Iganan, I mean, to the extent that he gave his apology, he reneged it, reneged on that apology later. And Kim Gun Tae too kind of has second thoughts about what that meeting was, whether you know, a genuine apology had been given to him. Um, and so both Egan, Iganan and Kim Gun Tae kind of revised the version of their meeting that was already circulated in the press and sort of celebrated as a moment where South Korea, I mean, where these two men could go beyond their past. And then they, of course, become allegorical for, you know, the country sort of uh, suturing of its past wounds. Um, and Iganan, uh, you know, and so, I mean, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a really infuriating story, but also really fascinating because Iganan ends up um, finding God, right, in, in, in prison. He becomes a minister, I think, after he, he leaves, um, after he finishes his sentence. Uh, and then, you know, gives series of interviews where he totally just revises, you know, how, what, what happened in this meeting and how, you know, and again, remakes on his apology and remains, you know, Unap unapologetic um, for what he's done. Um, so, you know, how do we, yeah, how do we square that, right? With, uh, with a desire to kind of move, move forward and put the authoritarian past behind uh, us in South Korea. And, you know, that is not unrelated to um, 
the you know Lee Myung Bak and Park Geun Hye presidencies that followed Kim Dae Jung and Noh Myung presidencies. You know, I remember when Noh Myung uh, came to power. Um, you know, it was really one of those things where you felt like, okay, yeah, now we are on this this path forward of quote unquote deepening democracy, and well, you know, the, it'll never turn back, right? Uh, and you know, I mean. Yeah. Um, well, I don't want to diverge, digress too much, but um, suffice it to say, another candlelight revolution or candlelight protests uh, waited was waiting in the um, around the corner. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. I really hope you're enjoying this episode of the podcast and I apologize for this interruption, but I'm just going to take this moment to remind our listeners that we've made a conscious decision here in the Korean App Podcast not to run advertising in any way. So if you do enjoy the podcast and you listen regularly and you do want it to continue, it is important that you do your best to support us at the links below or by sharing, liking or commenting on the podcast across social media. All your help in this regard is invaluable. And now back to the episode. Um, that is probably a good note to move on to the second part of our right. discussion. Um, and um, I, I might just start here. And a lot of people are not going to be that familiar with Korean poetry or the period. So just briefly, who was Kim ji Ha? So probably the most memorable um, character description of Kim ji Ha was given by another writer. Uh, who called the entire decade of 1970s, you know, a period of war between the dictator Park Jong-hee and Kim Ji-ha, right? That's what the entire 1970s boiled down to, boiled down to for him. Um, Kim Ji-ha was sort of the great dissident poet of the 1970s. Uh, he was imprisoned uh, almost for, for most of the 1970s. Um, and released only after the assassination of uh, Park Jung-hee. Uh, he was uh, famous for writing a satirical poem satirizing uh, Park Jung-hee's uh, administration um, and uh, was on death row at one point. And he became a co-celeb among you know, writers all over the world and intellectuals all over the world. Um, people in Japan, in the US, you know, in Germany, they signed, signed petitions for his release, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and he ended up winning uh, the Lotus Prize, which is the proverbial sort of uh, Nobel Prize for the third world. So yeah, I, he was a poet. Uh, he was also um, a, a playwright. Um, uh, but, you know, he was also, uh, uh, as, as, as a poet and as a playwright, he was also persecuted by the Park Jong-hee government. So he became sort of the dissident poet exemplar in the 1970s in South Korea. And interestingly, I, I, I might get us to hold our fire on this one, but such an interesting character, and this is your quote here, he was a martyr who outlived martyrdom, uh, a, an old, I'm going to quote here, an old icon of resistance chumming up to the daughter of the one of, of the man he'd once called a fascist. Um, this is going to, so I might get us to hold our gunpowder on that change and just stay in the moment because this is why his story is so fascinating. So um, you speak about a, a, a few of his works and I might just jump into the first one here and we can begin to build this up. So I think this is most um, famous of work. I'm not sure if that's correct, but this is satire or suicide. And it, for all its importance, you're right, it's also um, a piece of faulty memory of a kind. Yeah, so I mean, I would say Kim ji has most famous piece is probably not that piece, mm. uh, but something called Five Bandits, or Ojok, which is a long poem. And it's most famous because he got, um, he went to jail for it. Um, but this piece that I write about in the chapters, uh, Suicide or Satire, is uh, an essay, literary essay, a piece of literary criticism. And in it, he cites a famous poem by another Korean poet, 
the original title of that poem was satire or transcendence or deliverance and hetai, which is a Buddhist term for release from the cycle of rebirths, um, the samsara. Um, and then Kim Ji-ha misremembered that title and remembered it as satire or suicide. And so his article, the title of his article became satire or suicide, not satire or transcendence or deliverance. And let's get into some of the language here of, of, of what he was pushing and why he was such a significant poet. Um, you're right. And again, this is important. He organizes, at least through his literature, um, a, a, a resistance of sorts around around this idea, which I've mentioned in other podcasts, but I might get explained briefly as well. Um, Minjun, Minjun ideology. And it's not just a call to, um, he doesn't just make this call to the um, average workers on the streets and to their traditional way of life and to ordinary modes of life, but he also takes a call towards traditional Korean life. So he bring he tries to reinvigorate um, old past, not old pastimes, but old, old uh, traditions like pansori. Yeah. So minjung, uh, which is a term for the people, but with a connotation that these are people who are oppressed um, by you know, the powers that be. That term becomes sort of the rallying cry for the anti-authoritarian resistance, especially in the 1980s. It's in the name of the Minjung, the oppressed masses, that um, they become the subject of history, new history in the 1980s uh, dissident movement. And you're right that Kim Ji-ha was one of the first people to really link sort of traditional uh, Korean arts and traditional literature and performances and um, figure uh, that really populates um, the traditional folk aesthetics kind of lifts it out of uh, that configuration and uh, links it to um, this politics of Minjung that would unfold, you know, in a major way. Beginning in the 1970s, but it, it, it becomes much more of a significant movement in the 1980s. Um, let's talk about part of that title, suicide. So. Um of course, uh, po po poetry and suicide seems to go hand in hand, not committing it, but the act um, and the discussion seems to be important. And um, importantly here, um, he, he, of course, he speaks about this and he speaks about it in, 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 in these wonderful lyrical ways. But um, he, I, 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 I missed this. I should have asked in the last question, the importance of, in, in the last section, the importance of sometimes what suffering can do for a movement. And there's this moment of um, this young student, uh, Park, Park Chong Chol, who was drowned when he was tortured. And it, it, it becomes this huge spark, this huge moment in 1987, when Korea refines its, uh, the Korean resistance movement refines its feet and makes that final push. And in this particular, context um suicide this time there's these two incredibly prominent suicides in i believe the 1970s um chung uh chung tae il and uh, kim sang jin and they play this heavily outweighed really important um um kind of uh, momentum in the resistance against uh authoritarianism yeah, and they are really uh, sanctified and sacralized in um, the anti-authoritarian and pro-democracy movements thereafter. Uh, Chan Tail especially becomes like one of the progenitors of the labor movement in South Korea. So suicide entered um, what you know um, what has what sociologists have have referred to as. Uh, repertoire of protest um, in a major way in South Korea in the 1970s. Also in the language there, I, I'm, I'm going to think of a, 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 a poem here. Um, I think it's Koan writing about Kim Chiha, 
And when the discussion of, of suicide comes up, the language often changes, the individual disappears. Instead, we're talking about we rather than you and I. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the martyr uh, becomes a figure and a cause. And around that cause, a collective community can, can aggregate um, and be, you know, galvanized. So, um, you know, Chan Tae-il, the garment cutter uh, who put himself you know, on fire in protest of the labor exploitation in um, Park Jung-hee's uh, rapidly developing South Korea, uh, you know, he became martyr in precisely that sense, where, um, wherein, you know, just the invocation of his name, of his name can, you know, um, can amplify uh, political energy. And so I think in some ways, Kim Ji-ha, when he becomes imprisoned, uh, becomes a martyr-like figure, even though, I mean, he's physically alive, but I, I see his imprisonment as kind of a suicide of a kind. And I think Go um, this poet who commemorated both uh, Kim Ji-ha and Chan Tae-il in his poetry, you know, kind of use similar language to describe the two men because he really saw Kim Ji-ha's imprisonment as kind of a suicide of a kind that can galvanize a political or give rise to a political community. I must ask a question about poetry because many people with modern ears may think to themselves, how on earth can a poet become a symbol of resistance in this way, especially a poet who is um, not interacting with people on the street because he's been imprisoned all this time. And you write quite eloquently at a couple of times in this particular chapter, how um, poetry at that time was this, this chief weapon again, of, of resistance against Park Chung-hee. So um, I might get to just, Talk about that briefly, because many people have this feeling of how on earth can poetry play this important role? Yeah, I think it's difficult for us. Uh, in, in, well, maybe not so difficult after the inauguration of uh, Biden and, <laughs> and the, the, searing, the stirring, searing words uh, uh, of poetry uh, at the inauguration. Um, but I mean, certainly like, let's say, you know, at the turn of the, turn of the millennium, millennium um, it was kind of hard for us to imagine like poetry kind of having any kind of political um, power. Uh, so I think that's probably um, motivating your question. I think in the 19, 1970s, 80s, um, uh, poetry uh, did have that power. Uh, and and by extension literature and i mean i this is a subject of my earlier book writers of the winter republic but i mean in i for me i you know i argue that when you have such heavy censorship uh, literature becomes at last you know the final bastion right um where you know the the last tongue that the dictator hadn't managed to lop off completely and so that the literature itself becomes a medium in a much more um, for political change and revolution becomes a, a, a place where social force can gather. Um, and, you know, I, that's how I understand literature in the 1970s in, in South Korea. And poetry had the additional um, advantage in that regard of being able to be sung and recited in assembly. Um, and so you had, you know, many, especially after uh, Kim Ji-ha was in prison, you had these like nights of literature, Kim Ji-ha Munagem Ham, or um, nights of Kim Ji-ha literature, or nights of uh, literature of, you know, prisoners, um, where, you know, this, the signature event was recitation of songs and poems. Um, sometimes by the poets, uh, writers who are in prison, sometimes in honor of, of them, as we saw with ko -un. And there are very interesting kind of records of these events where um, 
you know, people would say, you know, I would, I would read that poem on paper and think, eh, meh, you know, eh. And then I would go to this rally or Unagebham or this service or whatever assembly happened to be taking place. And I would hear that poem being recited and it would be electrifying. And you would have power that I just didn't see, you know, when I was reading it on paper. Um, so, you know, that, that I mean, I, I, I would say in the 1970s uh, in Korea, poetry had that additional element uh, of being able to be deployed as part of the protest repertoire. Now, as we get into the turn and the interesting turn that happens in Kim Ji Ha's life, uh, I, I should get you to explain the political context here because. Um, as I, I think we, we, we touched on just briefly, 1987, June 1987, the democratization movement comes to it, its 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 own. There are these important suicides and um, this torture that we've touched on as well. And then in 1988, they have the first democratic elections inside South Korea. Um, the two leftist candidates, Kim Young Sam and Kim Dae Young, they they split their votes. So we get another conservative, um, uh, Ro Tae Woo comes back to power, but it is still a democracy. And yet in 1991, these um, suicides and self immolations start up again on the streets. So before we go back to Kim Ji Ha and the change in his mind and his uh, opinion within South Korea, uh, let's talk about the political context and this change that happens on the ground. Yeah, so you know, nineteen uh, the election, presidential election in nineteen eighty seven, uh, that occurs after um, after um, Chun Doo Hwan, the military dictator's handpicked successor, Do Tae Wu, upon the pressure of the June democratization movement of that year, uh, declares that you know he. He will uh, sit uh, and he will run for presidency in a direct election. And for years now, uh, South Korean presidential elections have been indirect. Uh, they were called stadium elections because they were essentially rubber stamping sessions for whomever the dictator you know, or the, um, the military regime had put forward. Um, so... Basically, it's a huge victory in 1987, and it's a victory that comes about um, through the deaths of uh, young people and student activists and labor activists. Um, but it's, it's a victory that ends up becoming really anticlimactic because, as Jed, you mentioned, both of the opposition politicians, candidates run, and they end up splitting the room. The vote, and then No Tae Woo, who who would have been, who was the handpicked successor of the military dictator, No Tae Woo, who was also a military general uh, himself, uh, he ends up becoming the president. So now, No Tae Woo's presidency is marked by this odd tension. On the one hand, we will have still in place a military dictator, but he was formerly elected procedurally elected, democratically. Um, and that tension, I think, manifests itself in a number of different ways, um, including relations with North Korea, which is not part of our conversation today. And basically what happens is um, activists, student activists, uh, who are very dissatisfied with this result, uh, find themselves um, being more radicalized and also fewer in number because a lot of the middle class, a lot of, let's say, the, the white collar workers who had supported the, the shift, the end of military dictatorship, and who supported the shift to direct presidential elections are saying, well, yeah, we did it. And that's now in place. We now have procedural democracy, but that's good enough for me. And they they don't they don't want to continue to have this kind of really chaotic and massively charged violent political environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I think those who do continue to remain uh, within the dissident resistance circle then are finding themselves uh, or um, 
becoming within the, their smaller circle, finding themselves more radicalized. And you know, one of the one of the tensions um, then um, erupts in this series of suicides uh, that sweeps across the country. Suicide, suicides generally of young people, university students, even high school students, uh, activists, organizers, labor organizers, etc. And that that happens in 1991. And then there's this extraordinary moment when the activists, the resistance fighters on the streets, um, they turn and look to their old icon, their old um, person who they drew so much inspiration from, Kim Chi Ha. And he re-enters the stage and he looks back at them. And I think you write like uh, a, a teacher scolding a student. And he says, you're all making a huge mistake. He writes this opinion piece called My Young Friends, What He Learned From History. And he publishes it in the conservative Chosun Ilbo. And he basically laments and lambasts them and says, the South Korean nation is no longer at risk. What on earth are you all doing? As if they're, and um, in a way criticizes them for just happily or haphazardly throwing away their lives um, because they don't want to put down their guns and recognize they've won the war. Yeah, and there, I mean, that's a very painful moment in the history of South Korean, uh, for the South Korean Demo democratization movement, uh, because it's the moment where, you know, they have to confront um, or the icon, um, mm. their idol falls off from the pedestal. Uh, yeah, and that article that he wrote, published in Joseon Ilbo, you know, I mean, if you read it today, I mean, the content of content of it, much much of it, I think for me anyway, makes sense. And even though at at the time, the act for the democratization movement, this was seen as a huge statement of betrayal, or conversion, uh, or apostasy. Um, you know, if you look at them today. I, I would see more of an evolution of thought rather than, you know, uh, around uh, about face. Um, nevertheless, it was really its political consequences above and beyond what Kim ji was arguing in that piece. Because it was a conservative Joseon Ilbo, it had some of those sound bites that ended up being extremely uh, useful for the for the Noteu government, um, and basically it allowed a certain kind of war of, war of representation to be won by the conservative conservatives and by the Noteu government. Um, the war of representation being these activists, democratic activists were um, were puppets; right? they were not um, agents or subjects of history as they were claiming, they were being sort of masterminded um, and that they had sort of a collective death wish or death fetish and that the radicalism of their movement uh, would lead to you know, calamities um, that we've seen elsewhere in the world, like Jonestown or um, the Asama Mountain Lodge um, hostage situation in Japan or Nechayev, you know, in the 19th century. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I think uh, because Kim ji was such an icon of democracy, this coming from him really helped turn the tide uh, against um, the radical students, student activists, and then just kind of settle this moment uh, when the Punshin Jungkook and the kind of energy that was that these Im uh, self immolations and suicides had been sort of generating in in society could have you know taken a turn um, and could have kind of forced a different trajectory. Um, there, it just put the lid on that situation. It helped. I mean, Kim Ji-as piece helped put the lid on that situation for the benefit of the Noteu. Uh, government and the conservative uh, political party. There's a, a an element in this of um, of uh, a, a kind of disconnect between the poet and his 
um, adoring fans in a way. You write really interestingly that um, while Kim Chi Ha was being adored by the public, he was in prison and all the great um, important and significant and tragic events of the democratization movement were passing him by and he wasn't there as part of it. He was idolized uh, from a distance. And though he came out of prison and in the 1980s when his works were um, suddenly allowed to be bought, he was commercially huge and this, uh, this phenomenon grew. But in some ways, the poet was disconnected from his own phenomenon. Yeah, and I think that is really, um, for me, poignant um, and ironic. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the, the, in the history of South Korean democratization movement, 1980 is huge because that's when, uh, May of 1980, that's when uh, the Chan Doo Hwan um, coup d'etat took place. He, he um, imposed martial law in the country. And then, of course, one of the first things he does uh, following the coup d'etat is to massacre um, civilians in Gwangju. So the Gwangju massacre and the subsequent um, uprising and, and the mobilization of the citizen army in Gwangju and the ultimate sort of uh, quelling of that uh, the citizen army, all of that becomes a, a very foundational moment in, in Korean democratization movement. Um, and it also makes Chan Doo Hwan a very hated figure. Um, so Chan Doo Hwan is much more hated, in, I think, in Korean uh, political history than his predecessor, uh, Park Jung Hee, uh, even though Park Jung Hee uh, governed, ruled uh, for 18 years. Um, so more than double uh, Chan Doo Hwan's uh, time in the office. But it's not until later that year, uh, in 1980, that Kim Ji Ha is released from the prison. So in some ways, I feel that, um, you know, the way he was so, uh, what we call in Korean, hyunjang, at the hyunjang, or at the site, at the site of the most, um, the, the sharpest conflict, at that, and at the side of the deepest con contradictions in society. Um, the way he was able to be like that for the 1970s under Park Jung Hee uh, dictatorship, uh, I think he just didn't have his footing for Chan Doo Hwan. Uh, he was not at the site. And then in, in the prison, uh, really, Kim Ji Ha had become kind of transcendental in his orientation. So, you know, um, when we talked about satire or uh, satire or suicide as a mis sort of uh, uh, product of faulty memory um, on Kim Ji Ha's part of a poem that initially was titled Satire or Transcendence. Transcendence. Um, you know, Kim Ji Ha's poetry was able to articulate this kind of minjung oriented aesthetics and politics because he foreclosed the plane of transcendence in the realm of art. And he said, well, artists are not separate from minjung or the oppressed people. Artists are part of the minjung. There is no other plane, no other transcendental plane. Uh, to which artists can aspire or poets can aspire. So he foreclosed that and then gave birth to a kind of a powerful Minjung aesthetics uh, in, in the 1970s. But I think in prison over time, transcendence, trans, transcendence that plane became so necessary for uh, Kim Ji Ha just to survive. And so when he comes out of the prison, a lot of the works, especially in the latter half of the 1980s, the new works that he writes is really abstract and kind of cosmic mm -hmm. in scale and misses that presentness at the site of confrontation and conflict that had marked his works earlier. I, I actually, I, I really like what you said there. I found it really interesting. Um, 
And it reminds me of something else in your article that um, Koon, you write at one point, Koon, you write, commanded Kim Chi Ha to die in prison. Of course, he's not being literal here, but he says, this is his um, poem. Don't you walk out of prison alive, rise as a corpse and then fall. And um, in some ways, um, the Kim Chi Ha in prison was a symbol he could never be outside of prison and he could never have been. And in some ways, the minute he walked out, he had already died as a poet in so many people's eyes. And it's this idea of the importance of death again. And I might add one more really important. I, I love this quote of yours in your book. And this it comes to the personal element of this, that when he did walk out, he was fighting a war that, or a battle that wasn't his anymore. And sometimes suffering and pain and, and this kind, it, it, it's always personal. And you write, mm -hmm. perhaps for Kim Chi Ha, Chan Du Wan was never his dictator. And that's the important point here. He was disconnected from the suffering in a way, from his years in prison. It was never his dictator to fight. Yeah. I think that I think that's kind of true, and that was unacceptable. I think for the movement that really still needed Kim Ji Ha's name, and Kim Ji Ha was hot as a weapon mm -hmm. against the dictatorship. I mean, the dictatorship was still going on, and dictatorship was in many ways worse uh, from the eyes of the democratization activists, and they needed Kim Ji Ha as a as a sword. And Kim Ji Ha, um, you know, came out of the prison and he wrote that poem. And he said, you know, sword, you know, if I, if I need you again, you know, may you become a lotus flower, you know. Um, and that's not what, he, what they needed him for. But that's where Kim Ji Ha had gotten as a poet and as an individual. And there, I think, was a real mismatch between a poet's sense of his own individual self and beliefs and and life and philosophy which had evolved um, and maybe in a less contentious time that evolution would have been embraced as something beautiful by the public by the populace but the times were extremely contentious more contentious than ever and Gwangju had made the the terrain of democratization movement even more uh, fierce and that kind of declaration came across as a you know I mean it befuddled some readers and a lot of readers wanted to continue to hold on and cling on to Kim Ji Ha and wanted to interpret it you know in the best light possible they want him to continue to be that um, author of the, the, the democratization anthem with a burning thirst, you know, and, uh, and yeah, I don't think he was that. So, um, you know, the sense of betrayal, then I think the democratic, the pro democracy movement circle feels toward their once idol, then also has a very negative impact back on the poet. Um, and I think poet Kim Ji Ha became increasingly sort of paranoid. Um, as, you know, this kind of criticism became more vocal. As a, as a, um, a final question here, um, and this is at the very end of your chapter, and I thought this was an important point, not just to sum up this part, but also the first part that we spoke about in this interview. Um, you talk about um, Korea's uh, difficulty in dealing with its history and with this history of um, developmental dictatorship. And you touch on um, Park Gone again, which we spoke about a little bit already today. And um, at this time, she is, this is 2016, 2016, 2017 that you write this. And you say that she has been impeached and um, perhaps there is, um, I might quote you actually, following the dramatic sequence of events of 2016, 2017 that impeached Park Gone and put her on trial, dare one hope that the impasse has finally been broken. And that is this impasse between um, modern Korea and, it, and its strained, difficult history that uh, a lot of people uh, are really still struggling to get over. So I wonder now, 
looking back, how you feel about that? Do, do you see any positives in this way? Do you think that this has been an important moment or, um, or are we still just as stuck as we've always been? Yeah, so, you know, that's a really great question. That's also very difficult to answer. <laughs> There's, um, you know, Koreans are fond of saying that politics in Korea, in, in, in Korean politics, one month is like a year, uh, meaning that it's incredibly, like, within one month, like, things can happen. Uh, that you would, would not expect to be able to, you would not expect an entire year to be able to contain, right? So I would say that that is really true. I mean, today, just yesterday, all kinds of news um, headlines, um, uh, you know, heralded sort of a possibility of, sort of a reform uh, of the prosecution service in Korea, which is one of the um, legacies and residues, remainders of the authoritarian era. Um, so, you know, I mean, if you had asked me uh, when I was writing this article, I think in like 20, 2018, 2019, I think I would have, uh, you know, unequivocally said, yes, I, I do hope, I dare to hope. If you had asked me in 2020, <laughs> I think I would have said, and then earlier in 2021, I think I would have said, oh my God, you know, this, um, the establishment is just really difficult to reform. And the authoritarian legacies are extremely, extremely stubborn uh, and deeply ingrained in Korean society. And the candlelight, you know, the, all, all of the optimism that the candlelight protests generated are kind of turning into like despair. Um, I would have said, said that in 2020 uh, and then in early 2021. Uh, today, I don't know. <laughs> there seems to be yet another turn and a fork in the road. And just it's very difficult to fore, foresee. There's a Korean election, presidential election next year. A lot of it, a lot of what happens thereafter will depend on the, the outcome of that election. But, you know, one thing that I think um, I do feel now is, you know, I think there, there are times when um, toward, toward democracy, you know, uh, South Korean society has moved, um, taken, let's say, two steps forward and then one step back. But there are times when South Korean society took one step forward and two steps back. Um, but over the long, over the long haul, uh, if you take long view of things, uh, you know, it's, it really is a very remarkable story. And so, and it's a story that I think Koreans, South Koreans are very justifiably proud. And so now I feel that there is enough of um, the Korean public that takes pride in that history. Um, that it would be very difficult for um, things to go back into the dark cave again. That is a, a, a great, wonderful, hopeful um, note to end the podcast on. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. It really has been an absolute pleasure here. Of course, below the podcast today, I'm going to link uh, not just links to um, Yongju's books, but also where you can keep up with her, her ongoing academic writing. Um, uh, as I said, today, I based my discussions only around two chapters of Yongju's, and we didn't get to most of the stuff in those chapters, but they're not just um, interesting as I'm sure you've all found out today, listen to this podcast, but incredibly fun, interest, uh, wonderfully um, uh, fluent in their writing style. And um, I, I picked these two articles up to read throughout the week and I read them in one sitting. They really were really gripping. So I can't encourage um, you to listeners to go and get your hands on Yongju's work and read it for yourself. You will not be disappointed. And on that, again, Yongju Rio, thank you so much for your time. It really has been a pleasure here. You're much too generous, and it's been my pleasure. So thank you, Jed.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. This is just a final reminder that we've made a conscious decision here on the Korean Now podcast not to run advertising. And so the podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast at the PayPal or Patreon links attached below. Or importantly, you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And on that, I hope to see you again for the next episode. Thanks again for listening.